Two point zero zero. Yeah. Yeah. I love that. Price. I could never get a spot. Uh, call me. <laughs> <laughs> call the chef of the year. Yeah, she'll oh, get yeah. you a table. Yeah. For fun, um, and which really annoyed her, I actually pushed that wood grill to the front of the restaurant. <laughs> and then I started barbecuing at the front and there was smoke everywhere. And she was just like, what the, f you know, what are you doing? A couple of weeks later, they sent back and said, hey, we love your bud me, so yeah. we'll, do it for, we'll do it for 10K. Were like, you like happy or were you like, whoa, wait, like, hey, why'd you quote me 20K the first time? Yeah, I was so pissed off. <laughs> Y'all, we may have one of the most talented guests I'm, I'm going to put her for in the year running already. We got Miss T coming up. T Lee, yes. Um, the mastermind chef behind uh, Anchovy Melbourne, Jiao and Kakom. I think T is probably a chef I look up to the most. Her ethos, her approach to cuisine, I think is next to none. Her, She just makes everything herself from fish sauce to butchering things for bun meat. It's crazy. And just her integrity within her craft just... Really tasty food, Southeast Asian inspired dishes at a high level, great execution, unpretentious, great comfort food, and so much finesse and elegance. So um, I think her foundation or what she's building would be a great uh, for the younger generation of Vietnamese chefs to really look at and say, hey, fuck, I want to I wanna cook this stuff as well. Yeah. You, you a little nervous? You seem a little nervous. I'm actually there. really nervous. A little bit hungover as well, unprofessionally, but... Uh, yeah, mm -hmm. we'll see how I go. <laughs> yeah, so we'll meet T. She's coming. Might need to carry me. Get you soon. Welcome T to the show. Welcome. Oh, sorry, I'm just super nervous because T's here. She's like my idol. Thanks for having me. <laughs> yeah, of course. Glad to have You're you. You're making here. me nervous now. <laughs> You're doing the opposite job that a like. A I know. I just made it really bad. <laughs> okay, let's go. Don't worry. We've been filming. What are you talking about? I know. I know. I know. I know. This is. Yep. We got it. It's game time. Well, T. So, what do you think of Vietnam so far? Great. Yeah, <laughs> great. No, no, it's actually so good to be back. I think, you know, for so many years I've been back with my mom, but not as a chef, you right. know, mm -hmm. and I think probably the last couple of years is really, it's when I've really, I am a chef now. Yeah. And I think just looking at Vietnam in a completely different lens. And I think now it's just like my brain's just going, pool, you yeah. know, there's so much to learn and, you know. I'm a pin drop in the whole entire picture. Right. Yeah. So you're here uh, cooking with Vid Harvest. So this is your first time cooking in Vietnam? Uh, first time, yes. And how did you find that experience? Um, I think uh, fantastic in the sense where I think the connections build around Vid Harvest and the uh, Australian Vietnamese community here. Not, to, not just the Australian Vietnamese community. I think yesterday I posted something up about all the Viet girls. You know, it, mm. it's so... So refreshing to see, you know, p people at our age coming back here, calling this them th their home now and just rediscovering their roots, even though they haven't been here. Um, yeah. Yeah, it's cool to see. Yeah. Kind of help, like, reconnect and spread the word. Yeah. But you've been doing some other travels too. Like, you went to Laos earlier as well, or were you in Thailand? I was in uh, Chiang Mai. Chiang Mai. Yeah, and Chiang Mai. prior to that, I was in um, Singapore. Oh, nice. Yeah. Any difference in, like, when you're... I guess when you're traveling as a chef, you probably look at things differently, especially food and markets. You know, you're almost, yeah. it's, it's almost hard to separate the, the business yeah. from the enjoying it almost, right? Yeah. And like, what's it been like to be in Singapore and Chiang Mai as opposed to like being in Vietnam? Singapore is such a, you know, it's just such a powerhouse city, mm. you know, it's such an international city. And we were cooking at a restaurant called Carla and I was... I think afterwards I kind of realised my menu, you know, it was like we had lobsters from Canada, we were using yeah. pork from Spain, we oh, had wow. produce from Australia, we had stuff from um, Malaysia, Indonesia, and I was just like, oh, my God, like it's just such... It's like totally opposite of yeah, what you really do, right? Yeah, it's such a global city and it was really cool to see. Um, yeah. I brought my sous chef with me and it was her first time in Singapore, so it was yeah. good to introduce that side to her um and then Chiang Mai is you know I was there 20 years ago as a backpacker you know and I remember there was no lights and now coming back to Chiang Mai I was like oh my god <laughs> like what has <laughs> happened you know it's it's so developed now mm. and uh we were lucky enough to meet uh, meet up with Andy Andy Ricker and he yes. you know hung out he's a legend mm. I love him yeah mm. um and you got to cook with him when uh he went to Australia you know for like 
was it Melbourne Food and Wine? Wine? Yeah, uh, we hosted him. Um, I think I received an email from Pat Norse going, yeah. I've got a friend named Andy. I don't know if you know him. And I was like, shut up. Do you, <laughs> do, do you mean the Andy Ricker? Yeah. And he's like, you know him? Like, no, I don't know him. But I have every single of his cookbook. Uh, um, yeah, so it was really cool to yeah. um, work with Andy and someone so dedicated to a, a cuisine for the last, I don't know, 30 years. It's pretty, pretty cool. And you hosted him at uh, Gakom, right? Yeah. Your, your bug me shop. So. And he's, Andy Ricker is like just a madman when it comes to bug me. He, he's basically, he's, he's come over here to Vietnam, mm. tried to learn as much as he can yeah. to make the bug me, gone all the way to Chiang Mai, bought all the equipment from Vietnam, yeah. shipped it over there. Now he's trying to make bug me's in Chiang Mai and it's like very close to what you would get here. Yeah, great. Yeah. And then, yeah, so you ha- so I think he would have been amazed with what you're doing with Gakko. Yeah. Um, yeah, so we hosted him there because our restaurants are – so our actual restaurant's only 25 seats. So mm. we, we don't have enough space to sit because the, the Melbourne Food and Wine Festival, you need to do about 50. Mm. And so then – we, we, we opened up Gakom and the restaurant. So we just had people in the backyard, in the restaurant, yeah. on the, you know, the Bun Mi side. It was like kind of like organized chaos because, you know, <laughs> we were running food from two separate kitchens. Yeah. One, one, the restaurant has the woks and then we have a massive hearth on the Bun Mi side. Mm-hmm. Sounds like a nightmare. <laughs> just, so just for, I guess, for the fans over here that don't know, T has a restaurant called Anchovy, but now is called Jiao. Correct. And then next door to Jiao is Gakong, which started, I guess, during lockdown, during, after lockdown? During lockdown. Do you want to tell us a little bit about that? Um, so during the pandemic, we, we decided to close the Anchovy because we were just trying to figure out what to do. Um, Melbourne was in the world's longest lockdown and... You know, uh, at that time, a partner and I were living quite far away from Richmond. And every time we drove back into the city, um, to Richmond, like the whole entire street was dead. Like not even a single person on the street. It was just, it was just really sad to see the whole entire neighbourhood kind of disappear. And uh, I think we're pretty fortunate that we have such a huge industry following um but i think all the other restaurants are along the street it's more like neighborhood joints mm. and so we my, pa- my partner actually thought i was crazy i was like we should do bun me's out of our window <laughs> and then i was like because you know we're we're in the restaurant business we we miss talking to people yeah and so you know the first day i was like yeah we just do a couple bun me's and i think i brought 20 bread rolls you know thinking that's all i'm gonna sell the whole entire day um, and then we, for fun, um, which really annoyed her, I actually pushed our wood grill to the front of the restaurant. <laughs> and then I started barbecuing at the front and there was smoke everywhere. And she was just like, what the, f-? you know, what are you doing? And I was like, look, we're in lockdown. We might as well make it fun, right? Yeah. Um, so we started barbecuing um, and then we we literally sold out within ten minutes. Around ten minutes. <laughs> and then, and then <laughs> after that, we uh, I was like, okay, so I was like, we'll buy a bit more by me. And then we I think we brought another twenty. And then so the next day we bought forty. And then forty went to I don't know like hundred, hundred went to three hundred. My God, it was <laughs> mental, you know, like. <clears throat> As a chef, you know, you're cooking in a restaurant where, you know, it's so systemized. And yeah. then all of a sudden you're doing this product that you thought was so easy, but it was actually so labor intensive. And yeah. the kitchen was so far from where the dining room is. And, yeah, it just went – the sandwiches got had a own identity yeah. and it just took off. And yeah. when we got out of lockdown – we stopped doing it. So we went back to the restaurant and then we started getting all these messages over Instagram and emails and everyone was just asking about the sandwiches. Yeah. No, one, no one was asking about the restaurant. <laughs> everyone was asking about the sandwiches and we're like, oh, no, 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 no. It was just something we did for fun. Yeah. And then people kept, e- you know, emailing. So cool. And so there was such a... So then there was such a huge pressure to bring it back. So every time we were in our lockdown, we would just bring the sandwiches back. And yeah. I think that was very, 
that was an offering that was very fortunate to us. And, you know, like every, because when lockdown happens, what are you going to do with all the produce? Yeah. So we just like shoved everything inside the bun yeah. me. And so some of our bun me's, it was like, you know, garfish with prawn mousse that was crumbed yeah. inside of bun me. You, 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 you know, it was, it was just crazy. Like yeah. pine mushroom pickles, you know, um, very gourmet, but I think it was just a way to use all the produce within the restaurant. So, so with feelings like that, it's obviously moving away to what people know what I, I guess, I don't like using the word traditional, but what a bun me t- me is to them yeah and you're putting you know, um you're making use of food waste or what you have yeah what was the reaction like of um people coming um were they like oh this is this like is it meant to be gourmet or is it yeah too modern everyone was like everyone started calling us the bougie bun meats you know <laughs> like out the window bougie bun me out the window yeah but we were just like well we can either throw the garfish in the bin yeah. or just give you like a product that you're not going to get anywhere. Uh, yeah. And so I, I think during lockdown, people were quite open yeah. to whatever we were doing because okay. they, they understood the, you know, in and out lockdown concept. Yeah. But I think with the actual store, it, it's a question we get every single day. Uh, can we just get a traditional bun? Yeah, oh, really? And so, I, you know, we always tried to deter away from the word traditional yeah. to classic. Mm. You know, we don't have... Um, a classic cold cut bun me, but yeah. we pork bun me, but we have um, pastrami. So we yeah. did um, a we called it bun strami. We thought we were so smart. Uh, <laughs> puns, I love puns. Yeah. <laughs> so essentially, it's a it's a cold cut as yeah. well, but just done with beef and yeah. not pork. Yeah. So um, yeah, so I think people get it, people don't, and I think it's one of those things you just. And I heard you bring in whole pigs, you break them down. Yeah, you're pretty notorious for doing everything from scratch. Yes. To do fillings for a bun me. Like, I don't know who on earth does that. Yeah. <laughs> you talk about being labor intensive, the bun me being labor intensive. Yeah. But when you bring in a whole pork, butchering it just for your bun me, that's yeah. pretty crazy. Because like, it's like... That's admirable. Uh, I, I think if, for me, uh, as a chef, I think it's quite important to to continue on with these skills of butchery that we don't necessarily mm, learn. Yeah. Uh, and I think we, we, we have two, I guess we have the restaurant and we have the bun mee shop. So yeah. we, you know, certain cuts go to the restaurant, certain cuts go to the bun mee shop. Yeah. And I think, you know, we're, we're essentially a very small restaurant. You know, right. we're competing with big guns, big groups in, yeah. in Melbourne. And I, I think that's what kind of draws people towards yeah. applying for a job yeah. with us. Because they get to learn these skills that right. they probably won't yeah. learn right. elsewhere. Just, for somebody that's maybe not in the food and beverage, are you small in like terms of like amount of seats or just like like power from like employees, like work power, like Capital, amount of employees? Capital, financial or? investment. Everything. Just everything. Yeah, right? Only everything, the above. You know, we're the underdog. <laughs> yeah. Okay, yeah, yeah. Cool. Yeah. And I guess if you're doing all these labor intensive things for your bun me, obviously you're going to have to cost it out and charge accordingly so you actually somehow make a profit, right? Mm. Any any backlash? <laughs> uh, we're, we're actually just breaking even right now, which yeah. is really sad in, in yeah. terms of, you know, it is uh, sitting at $15, which is, but then when you think about it, you know, anyone over the age of, uh, I think, 20s, all our staff are quite mature. So the, it, their minimum wage is sitting at $28 an hour before you even add any of the, you know, Loading, uh, loading weekends, yeah. public holidays. You know, and then on the weekends, it's like, I think like $48 an hour, you know, yeah. like. And Which is good for an employee and yeah. well-deserved, but it doesn't match, I guess, a market that yeah. people want to pay for, right? Yeah. And then, so with, do you ever get a chance, or like people coming in comparing your bun mis to like an auntie or an uncle over in like, I don't know, foot's grey or... All the time. How do you handle it? I always say, that's great. <laughs> uh, you know, it's, um, it's, it's very... People, people don't compare it in the sense where it's like, how you been to this place? They always yeah. make a statement. It's right. like, okay. do you know this place is only $10? And yeah. I was like, no, I haven't been there, yeah. but thanks for letting me know, yeah. you know. Um, but I don't know. I, I think when you eat... Our bun me, yeah. 
you, you could actually taste it. It is very different. Mm. And uh, I think, you know, it's, it's an evolution, you know. Mm. Uh, I am Vietnamese, um, but I've never grown up in Vietnam. Yeah. I'm just, you know, my, my cooking history, the way I've learned to cook, my interest in produce, um, where we're located, it, it, it dictates the direction of the, the restaurant. Right. Yeah. And... I guess for some, you either you know you either get it or you don't. And I think as chefs, restaurateurs, I think people always have an opinion, and you kind of just go, "Great, that's your opinion," and kind of move on, or else you're just going to get stuck. Right. That's uh, that's something I should probably take on board. It's hard, <laughs> but you know. Yeah, I'm actually really curious where like your maybe your passion for cooking, but definitely your passion for like making from scratch. Because we talked the other day a little bit about you know yeah. you're taking like a. a, a I do believe what you said was like a crab that's a pest and making yeah. like a mumbakia pretty yeah. much. And so like yeah. where this where this just like desire and just like love for cooking and making things from scratch come from? I think it has to be my mother. You know, like we we grew mum we grew up, you know, single mother in Australia, refugees, four girls, no money, you know, one income. And, you know, we, we I remember growing up, we lived in like the western suburbs and, you know, we were probably the only Asian family in the area at the time and surrounded by, you know, Anglo uh, Australians. And I, I remember always seeing the neighbours always like poking their head over, you know, the fence, having a look, you know, going, what is this crazy family up to, you know? And then especially my mum, you know, like all these pickles and she used to have fish sauce in like um, glass jars and putting under the sun. And because we didn't have money, like, you know, we didn't buy all the luxuries mm. like kids wanted, like, which I think is probably a blessing yeah. now. So we were never let, allowed to have Coke, Coca-Cola. Yeah. And, you know, if we wanted to drink soy milk, we had to make our own soy milk, you wow. know, like, you know, wow. stuff like that, you yeah. know. And sometimes I remember as a kid, I'm like, this is shit, yeah. <laughs> you know, like, it's so shit. Um, and, you know, like when artichoke season's in, you know, yeah. she used to like dry artichokes on the hills hoist yeah. at the back, you know, and it's just, I don't know. And then just being around that and, yeah. you know, um, I guess you didn't really appreciate it in your upbringing. Mm -hmm. And then when I became a chef and started working in fine dining, yeah. when, you know, the whole thing of fermentation started to explode, I yeah. was like, everyone's like, well, you know, we're doing this. And I was like, oh, shit, no one's been doing this for <laughs> ages. Yeah. Right? Yeah. You, mean, yeah. you mean Noma didn't invent this? <laughs> <laughs> what? Please don't give them any airtime. <laughs> yeah. Um, so I think it's... Yeah, and then definitely my mum. Okay, yeah. that's cool. She taught you how to make nook mum as well, no? I saw it. Yeah. Was it out in the back? Out in the back. With local anchovies or? Uh, yeah, local, local anchovies. Um, and it's something I've always wanted to do for such a long time. Yeah. And, you know, I had no idea anchovies existed in, like, uh, Port Phillip, which yeah. is just down the road where yeah. I am, you know, until... And then about actually four years ago, I met this fisherman because I was actually trying to um, stop because yeah. um, they were banning um, f commercial fishing in Port Phillip. And yeah. there was a local fisherman who was only fishing for like sardines, yeah. which is so sustainable, but they've just put a blanket mm -hmm. no over everything. So I met Phil back then and it's only like I think four, Four months before that, actually, which was last year, yeah. he was like, do you know there's actually anchovies in the bay? And I was like, no way. <laughs> you know, when did you tell me this four years ago? <laughs> you know, um, and so he took me out and he took, it took us out um, and then we, we caught the fish and we salted on the boat and then brought it back. Yeah. Good looking anchovies. I saw the video. Mm, like, man. It, so fresh. Yeah. It's so, so fresh. I've never had anything like it. And mm. then. There was an Italian guy there and he was, darling, just eat it, you know. <laughs> like, <laughs> like just after you just caught it. Yeah, and he's like, it's so sweet. And then I had it. And, you know, you, you would think that it's from the ocean. It'll be like yeah. salty, but yeah. complete opposite. Yeah, because I got told that to make the mum, the anchovy has to be live when you salt it. So if you're importing something from ages, it's not the same. It yeah. has different um, characteristics when you're making it. Yeah. 
That's crazy. Yeah. It's I mean, right off the doorstep. If it dies, like the proteins will release, yeah. making the muscles contract, mm. and you probably get more of a sour yeah. flavor. Yeah. Yeah. But um, have you actually got to try any batches of your Nook Mom yet? Have you gotten there yet? Um, yeah. Like, so over the years, I've actually made like um, Nook Mom with different types of fish. Um, I think my favorite uh, so far, I've made one with Mum where it was like pineapple and garfish. Oh, wow. And it's so nice. Like, yeah. so, so, so nice. Yeah. And you bottling those things and selling it? Um, no, but there's been a lot of, like, <laughs> there's actually quite a lot of interest, yeah. I think, um, within the community and the Melbourne food scene. Yeah. Because um, I think people are actually quite um, excited that, yeah. you know, someone's making fish sauce with local anchovies. I think, yeah, in Australia, we like to celebrate local things. Yeah. Like, if someone's making things in australia they would rather purchase that rather than something yeah. that's imported right yeah. and I, I think you're a good person to ask this question could you make like fish sauce art more artisanal so you're like oh this is this is 2018 pineapple and garfish nook mom yes you know what i mean like can yeah. you do that and like sell it and kind of bring awareness to it i, I think so i think i think australia is pretty they're ready i yeah. think and especially melbourne where it's it's all about the produce and yeah. uh i think that's what made me fall in love with melbourne because when I moved to Melbourne, I was actually surprised that farmers were just dropping off produce in crates to the restaurants we were mm. working at. And, you know, and then then you start to see, you know, about 100 k's out of Melbourne. You've got all these small producers, beef, lamb, vegetables, yeah. and, you, and, you know, they're all small producers just doing their own thing. Mm. I think one of my most... Um, admirations for you is your dealings with or how you're processing anchovy because for me it's one of the most amazing restaurants i find in australia it's i guess synonymous with a lot of chefs like you know have you been to anchovy like everyone talks about it but it's you're still trying to figure it out you've replaced it with jowl mm -hmm. and now you've taken it through processes where it was like a casual place and you did i guess a set menu yeah where is anchovy going I'm pretty sure everyone's asking this. Um, we're not 100% sure yet. And I, I think we, we just, when we moved into the set menu, we realised that we, we intellectually grew out of the space. And, you know, and then also I'm at a point now in trying to rediscover my roots, you mm. know, and try to, I, I guess, ex express a, a new direction where the restaurant's taking and you know i think my dream is to have a contemporary thatched house you know on a farm that's in australia somewhere where i'm not sure <laughs> sound like me yeah <laughs> with some walks raging fire in the back yeah. <laughs> walks <laughs> no actually it's going to lead me to a few um this may be a little bit of a loaded question but kind of like where you're at your point in your like your chef career like what brings you joy? Is it more of just like creating a dish or is it more getting back to your roots and discovering things or like what brings you that joy now? I think a little bit of everything, you know. Um, I have my I have my days where, you know, I'm like, fuck this shit, <laughs> like, you know, yeah. and I think, you know, everyone goes through that. Um, and, you know, there are days where, you know, I'm just like, I want to do this, this and this. Yeah. And, you know, you, you kind of just go off and you do it and you feel so great because you kind of nail everything. <clears throat> and there are times where, you know, you, you don't and that sets you back. But I, I think it, it's a little bit of everything, you know. I, I think for me it's about longevity now. Right. You know, I, I'm i 38 now. I've been in the industry for 20 years my right knee is giving out, you know, like I, I think I need to find the balance. So I have to, for myself, I have to find projects that keeps me still excited, you yeah. know. I have to continue exploring, eating, travelling, yeah. teaching, mm -hmm. l learning the craft, you know, mm -hmm. honing the skill, you know, to, to keep it exciting. I think, you know, if I was to continue to do what I'm doing and just, open bags of protein and yeah. you know i think i would probably be pretty sad yeah yeah I'm kind of like burnt out yeah right i never even thought about it but i talked about and i think bowels learned so much 
probably like the last six months being in Saigon. Mm. But then the other day he said, man, my cooking skills like about the shit. I haven't created anything in a long time. I haven't. Like I, yeah, I, I don't want to say I gave up, but I just had to walk away. Yeah. And I haven't been able to find, you know, I do these pop-ups here and there, but they're not like on a consistent basis. Mm. So sometimes when I'm doing something, I was like, my mind's just blank. I was like, I don't know what to do with this piece of vegetable, you know. Yeah. And it's it's hard, like. That's why for you, just seeing you just constantly just move and move no matter what challenges that you're faced with, you're just constantly creating these, not dishes, but projects. Like apart from being a chef, you're also like quite handy with the tools. <laughs> mm, <laughs> right? yeah. you, you basically, I guess, self-renovated the restaurants and stuff like that. Oh, and you're yeah. building, or you built a van. Yes. You built a van? No, not a van, but like one of those um, camper, van. camper vans. Oh, man. And then you're traveling, you're cooking it out of that van. So, and then I think even that could be a project that you could work on, no? Yeah. And, and you know, like for the last, for, from, I think for me about three years ago, everything kind of changed. I actually got, actually a bit longer, four years ago, I actually got burnt out so mm. bad. Like I just, you know, there's a constant pressure to yeah. keep doing stuff, the so constant pressure, and then just like being in the industry, and then it just, it kind of just sucks you in. Yeah. And then you just find yourself, you go to work, you get off work, you go to a restaurant, you eat, yeah. you critique, you go back to work, you, you do, you critique your own food, and then someone critiques you, yeah. and then, you know, it's just this vicious cycle of just yeah. critiquing, you know? <laughs> and I was like, actually, um, you know, we went to actually we went to Paris. We went to do a, a dinner with the guys at Cam, and oh, then yeah. yeah, and then that didn't that didn't work out. And then we, so we ended up going to um, Corsica. And we went for a hike, and yeah. uh, you know, I think at that moment I was like, actually, wait a minute, you know, like we are, you know, we we control our lives. Yeah, you know, we 100%. we we don't have to. I don't have to put myself in that vicious cycle, and then. You know, I was lucky enough to meet this amazing architect in Melbourne. He's kind of been a mentor to me in some degree. And just seeing someone so passionate about a completely different other industry, yeah. I was like, wow, there's a whole world out there besides <laughs> hospitality, you know, because you, you, you just get so absorbed. Yeah. And then you meet someone who's like so into what they're doing but so curious about you know, and then you kind of realize, actually, wait a minute, you know, you, you can actually have a life within yeah. this industry and do other things. Yeah. And, you know, before cooking, I was studying design. I wanted to be a furniture maker. And yeah. so I was like, I bought, I bought a van yeah. and then I just stripped it and just, just learned. You Crazy. Know. Well, talking about like pressure and living up to expectations, I'm not, I'm not big on awards, but congratulations on Gourmet Traveller okay. Chef of the yes. Year. Oh, thank you. So what's that? How, how was that feeling? Because I, I think Gourmet Traveller is a little bit, I could um, relate to it more because it's more a peer-based um, mm. voting system. Yes. So this is like your peers, your fellow industry, like chefs and that voting for you. So of all the chefs in Australia, Chef of the Year. Yeah, uh, I hate. <laughs> that word because so er oh. everyone, well, everyone's like oh it. congratulations I'm like yeah. oh yeah sure you know um, and I, I think it, it, it was it was great to be recognised to mm. what I'll, you know what I've been doing because you know I, I feel like I just cook food I, I love and yeah. you know and it's not I guess very plated yeah. you know but it still has an essence and so and you know it, it's it's nice to be to see the industry move away from that fine dining. Yeah. What a good chef can be. Yeah. yeah. And it's more like, um, like you said before, make, although you could just buy the cuts or it's better to do the whole process. So you you can teach the next generation, the younger chefs, how to break down things and gives them skills. So you're setting yourself apart from, I guess, the fine dining restaurants where you're a casual-ish restaurant, mm. but you do, you, if you go to choose, someone chooses, works for a chef tea, they can actually learn some cool and handy tricks as well. Yeah. And I, I think it's because, I think my mentality with, with that is because I think I've worked for, 
you know, three really amazing chefs within my career and that taught me so much and was very open to teaching. And, you know, we, we did a lot of things with places where I worked and I, I find it now you, you, you don't get that anymore. Yeah. Yeah. And so it, it's good to pass down what you've learned. Mm. Sounds kind of like it's just come from your life. Like you've learned stuff from your mother, have to make your own soy milk if you ever craved it. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> and then from the chefs. And so now yeah. you, you're, you're kind of in that teaching role now. Yeah. So that's pretty cool. I, I, I admire that because uh, I think it's really important to, you know, take things you've learned and pass it to the next generation so they can learn faster and they can grow to a higher level, right? Yeah. And then, you know, I love, I love Asian food. So, you know, and they c- compared to, you know, Western food, the way European food, there's like a thousand cookbooks. I think when it comes to... Asian food, there isn't like a cook, there isn't a La Russe that we open yeah. up and go, oh yeah, that's how you make, you know, chong fan, you know, and then oh, you yeah. just do it, right? <laughs> and so I, I find it like I value so much in Asian cookery that I have to teach myself so I can pass it on. So the more people that's cooking Asian food, the better right. I see it. Oh, okay, yeah. that's interesting. So yeah. do you, are you kind of big on like people can express themselves when they cook Asian food or like you just want more people being exposed to it? More ex- exposure, understanding it culturally, not yeah. just slapping, you know, coriander, fish sauce and lime together, you know, it's just, yeah. Do you get, I, I, to be honest, I get this a lot when I'm, say I'm doing like an Asian dish and I'm mixing a bit of like, I guess, Western influence. It's called fusion. But when... Someone, my color, huh? My color, <laughs> possibly, yeah. Do something like that. Sun. It's called modern Asian or something. Do you get that? Yeah, all the time, you know. <laughs> and you know, well, technically, we are kind of fusing things together. Um, but I think it has its its bad con- connotations yeah. to it. But I. I think I answered this question um, to Michael Harden, one of the reviewers, and because he, he said, "Do you cook fusion food?" And I yeah. said, "100 percent," right, because okay. I fuse my memory, things I've learnt, my travel, mm-hmm. my work history together to mm. a dish. So I'm, I'm fusing memory. Oh, is it fusing or is it expressing? So oh, come on. <laughs> I don't know. I'm not good at English, so I can't do this part. A bit of both. A little more of like expressing fusion mm. is a little bit both. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, I love your outtake on this. Like, I always struggle with this. I always like, why do I have to be categorized? Why can't I just do me? Yeah, mm. 100%. Then, yeah. Yeah, yeah that's more. why I asked, is it more expressing? Because yeah. like, that makes that's, it more, that sounds more like, individual. Because for me, me, cooking is like an extension of a soul. Yeah. It's like what you've grown up being surrounded with, mm. what you grew up to eat, where you've traveled. So you're just expressing that. Mm. But then when you do it, all of a sudden it has to be categorized into like these, you know, genres and, it sort of, I feel, limits you on what you can do oh, and how you express yourself. Yeah, and that's why I sometimes I say to the consumer, you know, like some people just go to a restaurant and they just want to have a bad time. <laughs> you know, like so, <laughs> sometimes couples come in and I'm like, they're going to have a shit time. You just yeah. know, you just yeah. know. And, you know, like, and then there are so many chefs, who, you know, go out to eat and then, you know, they're, they're nitpicking at the restaurant before they even go, you know, and sometimes you just got to go with an open, open mind, open, you know. Because mentally you're already losing that battle. If yeah. you're there with a negative mindset and negative attitude, your dining experience is not going to be as good as it can be. I think we take a little, yeah, little break. Little break while the dump truck's here. <laughs> yeah, so much noise. Why are you not like that? I always like that. Just the sound effects of coming back for a break. It's just... <laughs> Unnecessary. <laughs> anyway, yeah, I think it's team, me in the mind. Um, I don't like these questions, but I'm going to do it to people who also don't like these questions. Okay, but <laughs> hit me, hit me. <laughs> Top five favorite cuisines. Right now? Yeah. For you personally. For you personally. Like, right. Well, what do you, I guess, what do you enjoy eating the most? Right now. Uh, so it always changes. Um, I think I love Italian. So, number, okay, well, number one. Southern Italian. Southern, Southern Italian, Italian number specific. one. Wow. Yeah. yeah. I didn't, actually did not pick that for you. Uh, you threw me off because you were just hyping up Asia <laughs> yeah, before no, and then we went Southern always, Italy. More, everyone should be cooking more Asian food, please. Yeah, yeah. But, but Southern Italy is the worst. <laughs> uh, but, I, you know, I, I kind of feel like, because it, it's, it's so simple. I, I kind of I see a bit of a... 
it's similar to Viet in, in the way where, it, like, it's so seafood heavy, the sauce, right. mm. and it's mm. very simple, it's mm. very... Three or four ingredients and tossed in a bowl with, with like pasta, noodles, whatever you want to call it. And it's, yeah. I, you know, I love it. Any uh, dish you've been kind of like. They also invented fish sauce as well. Garum. <laughs> uh, <laughs> we'll leave that for another time. Um, my favorite is probably s- Sardinian fish stew. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Nice. Seafood stew. I love yeah. seafood. Um, Laotian. Number two. Ooh. Laotian. Nice. Yeah. You get down with the but, sticky but there's, rice. But there's no, there's no ranking order. I'm just... Yeah. Oh, okay. okay. So... No, you got to rank it. No, I have to rank it. Then I, then I'll flip. <laughs> That's what I mean. Yeah. No, but this okay. is what's about to be crazy because I think I... What, what do you like to eat? Laotian food. Like, what do you like? Sticky rice. Sticky Ice rice. rice. The sausages. Amazing. Oh, All the yeah. lab. Lab. But you like raw meat. Lab. Lab. Yeah, yeah, love it. Do you like the lab with the bile? Oh, oh, I oh, no, I can't okay, do it. Yeah. I can't do it. Okay. I was, yeah, I was um, hanging out with like... And in Chiang Mai and there's some other chefs, and there was so much bile going on. Yeah, like, oh, it's man. very bitter. <laughs> but if you <laughs> use it in just the right amount, it's really nice. Yeah. It is nice, but it was it was a lot for someone who, again, you, I just don't grow up eating it. I just, I'm not around a lot. I don't cook with it. It's just to just have it for a whole week. I was like, oh my god. <laughs> <laughs> but bless themselves for trying to share their yeah. culture with me. Um, so yeah, two. Two. Uh, I love Japanese. Oh. Yeah. Any certain area or dish? No. I, I think I can eat chawamushi every day, I think. So. Yeah. 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 But then the Chinese do it as well. So, egg, mm. yeah. So, so good. So, like the, the jiggly egg dish. Mm. You should have like steam egg custard. Yeah. yeah. Just yeah. so people don't know chawamushi. Yeah. I just like the clean the cleanness of it. The s- simplicity of it. Yeah. I, yeah. Um... Mm, oh. <laughs> Indian. Okay, yeah, I'm down with that. Yeah, <laughs> I eat a lot of, I eat a lot of India food. Yeah, I love it. Um, like the naan and curry, or more like the dosa in the south and yeah. the water with the sambar and yeah. the coconut chutney. Okay, yeah. so more of like a southern. Nice. Yeah. A little bit lighter, I guess. Um, well, can I have six then? So okay. Actually, yeah. Obviously, you need Vietnamese. Of course. Uh, uh, and then the other thing is probably French food. I do. Yeah. Yeah, I just love eating all the charcuterie, terrines, mm. stuff like that. Cheese? Cheese. I love mm. cheese. You like a soft cheese, hard cheese, stinky cheese, blue cheese? All cheese. All cheese. Yeah. All cheese. Equal opportunist. Yeah. yeah. I like that. I'm like that too. Yeah. You never like, you never. I used to work in a cheese counter, <laughs> no, Whenever bro. you ask me, oh, cheesing with things, you're like, oh, fuck off, you never cheese this. Talk. That's okay. She's a guest. I yeah, know you too see. well. <laughs> <laughs> the what? I wasn't expecting Italian from you. Yeah, right off the bat. Italian. Bang, right. Bang, bang. Yeah. I always eat, yeah. I think it's like, I don't know if you've been to Melbourne, but there's a restaurant in Melbourne. Uh, I've called, been to Melbourne. Called Tipo. Tipo Zero Zero? Yeah. Yeah. I love that place. I could never get a spot. Uh, you call me. <laughs> <laughs> call the chef of the year. Yeah, I should uh, get yeah. you a table. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I've been I've been trying to go a couple of times. Can never really get a spot. They don't take people from Brisbane. <laughs> Probably. Melbourne is like, I don't know. I found Melbourne quite hard to get places. Like Flower Drum was hard for me to, to get a table. Yeah. Um, a lot actually. Flower drum, they're yeah. just so full. Yeah. And then I just end up just getting Chinatown, just getting some noodles or something mm. like that. Mm. Or, go, or go Lord of the Flies. Fries? Lord of the Lord Fries. Fries. Like, like Tom, I want to tell the story of book. you struggling with the neighbor, but I don't know if you want that on air or not. Yeah. <laughs> that's fine. Oh, uh, what about the lawyer? Huh? The lawyer? One? Yeah, the, yeah, that's a good one. Yeah, so I think when we opened the restaurant, I was actually so naive, which is yeah. probably a good thing because I think you just you just do it. Kakum. Uh, or no, anchovy. Oh, when you start with no, anchovy. Um, yeah, so anchovy is the, the original. Right, right, right. Yeah. Where she started I'm from. just making sure I'm on the right yeah. story. And for the viewers. Yeah. Um, so you're so, you know, I was younger, naive, yeah. you know, had no idea how to run, a, I guess, a hospitality venue, like a restaurant, you know. Um, and my business and my partner who's my business partner she was in she's in IT so also she had no freaking idea yeah um, and and if someone said to me back then you know once you run a restaurant you're not, you're not really gonna cook anymore and you're gonna focus on yeah all the other things yeah I would have been like yeah sure whatever you know like <laughs> but it's yeah so I, I think the last eight years I've kind of learned you know it, yeah. it, it it's not about me, yeah. 100%. You know, I'm just, you know, a little equation in the whole picture. And, you know, it, 
it's everything else. It's the staff, 100% it's the staff. You, yeah. If you don't have a good team behind you, mm. you know, forget about it. Um, finance, you yeah. know, um, and then I think just we, we did everything ourselves. Yeah. And yeah, which was, it was probably pretty hard in the first. So actually, let me, let me go back. We opened, 2015, we opened a restaurant on a shoestring for $100,000. And we took over a space in Richmond yeah. um, that we could afford. So it wasn't in any of the trendy areas. Yeah. It was kind of like on this really busy four lane kind of, not, not a highway, like pretty busy road. And there's a tram running through it. So, and it's so long, it stretches for almost like two Ks. Like, so you don't have clusters of people, you know? So probably the worst location you can ever put a restaurant on. Um, and we thought we were going to be this like communal kind of restaurant where everyone that comes in is like 25 maybe to 30 years old yeah. and in and out and the spend per head is going to be like 40 bucks you know and so our tables we had two two bar tables that was high with um bar seats and then we had the bar and no one under the age of probably 40 came in. <laughs> <laughs> and it was a complete disaster wow, because yeah. everyone was older. They had hip replacement, bad back. <laughs> you know, they were pretty – yeah, you name it. We, yeah. we, so our um, business plan, I think after this, like, first month, we actually just threw it in the bin because everything we planned for yeah. did not happen. Damn did not happen and so we were like okay um and then we got reviewed by good food and it just it just went kind of crazy yeah. and then all the people that are coming in were much older and way more demanding and after the first year we decided to renovate because saturday night we had a gentleman come to the restaurant and just started yelling so imagine saturday night the restaurant's kind of a diner a diner full he's in his 60s you guys lied to me you guys lied to me and we were like the hell? we didn't lie to you what's going on it's like there's no fucking seats here you know and it just <laughs> he just oh lost God. it and we're like there are seats you know yeah. and then but it was all bar stools and ah. you know and they're so picky so yeah. pedantic in that yeah. way and then you know, he almost made my partner cry and, you know, he was so angry. We're like, calm down. And, you know, he sa eventually he sat down. And by the time he left, he was like, great meal, but your day course sucks, you know. Yeah. And it's true. It actually looked like a, a mental asylum because mm. the cheapest colour of paint was white. So we painted the whole thing white. Yeah. And then it just had <laughs> these old pendant lights from the previous. It was actually so shit. I hate, <laughs> I hated coming to work every day. I hated coming to work. And then so we, we, we renovated and it was our first renovation project that we had to deal with uh interior designer and yeah. builders and we just had no idea how to talk to them and control them financially and yeah. the budget just completely exploded yeah and it took us so long <laughs> to you know to pay that money back yeah and so how do you go through something like that and be like yeah you know what let's keep opening restaurants like if it was just like that rough the first time with like the big investment and just like the people and just like where, what keeps you going? I I love restaurants, you know, mm. and I just I, I love what it can bring to people. You know, you can have the worst day and go to a restaurant and have a meal and, and like it, it changes your mood. You can go to celebrate with your family, you know, you can go by yourself, you know. I, I love what a restaurant can bring to people. And, you know, and I, I think that's, and then I think just being Vietnamese and having such a strong culture, I just want to bring those essence to the restaurant mm. and show show people this is like, you know, come to our restaurant. It's kind of like a family restaurant. This yeah. is what it can be, you know, like just looking, you know, looking after a customer. Right. You know, yeah. we are in hospitality, you know. Hospital 101. Yeah. Sounds cool. Like I really appreciate what you do because yours, I mean, the way you approach restaurants and cooking and I mean, honestly, it's like going into somebody's home and they're really going to get connect with you and be like, you're like, look, from my home, 
it, where my door, uh, mm. the doors of my home are open for you to come in. Yeah. And I get to express myself a little bit. You can learn about that. You can feel comfortable here. If you had a shit day, yeah. it doesn't matter because you're here, you're part of the family. And that's really cool, I think. Yeah. Kind of like, this is my home, but then you got to deal with like pesky neighbors. Yes. Right? <laughs> yeah. And so, um, so during lockdown, we decided to stop anchovy. And we took over next door, mm. <clears throat> which was like a massage parlor, by the way. <laughs> it was so creepy when we took over. Nice. Uh, <clears throat> found so many underwear. Like, oh, wow. Oh, anyway, well, that's another story. I hope you wore gloves. <laughs> um, <clears throat> so we thought it was as easy as just stopping anchovy, building yeah. next door, and potentially putting anchovy there. Yeah. And, you know, in, in Australia, we have to go through so many things, council, mm this and that to um, get, a, I guess, get a restaurant up and going. So yeah. next door was a massage parlor with no infrastructure and we, we needed a, li- a liquor license. So we, we thought, okay, tops, eight months to go through the whole process. And so this is 2020 and now we're 2023 and I still haven't. No liquor license. No. And so the neighbours took uh, council to court and also, which means also takes us to court so we were ringing around the industry trying to ask for people yeah. who know lawyers who deal with this kind of issue with about liquor licensing. So we got recommended um, a law firm and, you know, they, quote, they, they said they were happy to help us and it was going to cost us 20K. Holy Jesus. 20K. 20, 20K to go through this. And we said we would love to, but um, we're... 20K is a bit too much. And this is probably when I actually messaged you, Bao, and said, oh, yeah, what, what is it like? You know, <laughs> yeah, this is when I was this. like, maybe there's oh, no wow. there's, there's no point. Because, you know, at 20K yeah. and if you don't... So we had two court hearings. The first one, if we don't win, we have to go to the second one, which means we have to bring in sound engineers. And yeah. so we got quoted for sound engineering, I think it was 10K. So 30K total. So 30K, if we, we don't make it past mm. the first one. Yeah, so we were kind of weighing up everything, you know, the the shop lease was coming up and is it worth d- doing all that? Yeah. Um, and so anyway, so we sent the email back to lawyers saying, you know, yeah. we, 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 we can't go ahead. Um, and then a couple of weeks later, they sent back and said, hey, we love your bud me, so yeah. we'll, do it for, <laughs> we'll do it for 10K. They cut it in half? <laughs> Yeah, and so I was like, great. But then I thought Bunch about it. $10,000. $10,000 bond me. <laughs> but then I thought about it. It's like every other industry in the world can do whatever the fuck they want. Yeah. And when it comes to hospitality, imagine me going, yeah. someone coming in and go, actually, I'm going to charge you 150 tonight yeah. because, because, yeah. you know? Were like, you like happy or were you like, whoa, wait, like, fuck you, why'd you quote me 20K the first time? Yeah, I was so pissed off. But then <laughs> I, I, was, would be. I was more pissed off at the guy at the backyard. <laughs> and so we we were umming and ahhing and I guess being stubborn and we're like, you know, f- f- fuck him. Can I say that? <laughs> yeah, fuck him. We've already so, said fuck you times. Yeah, yeah, right. um, I'll be quite, be quiet on this, this podcast, but yeah, yeah. please swear. Um, yeah, so... And then so it turns out he's the neighbor's lawyer yeah. used to work for the law firm that we hired. So, right. so they liaised something. So and then so what they wanted us to do was build this three meter tall um, soundproof, outdoor soundproof wall. Uh, I don't know how that works. That doesn't make any sense. <laughs> yeah, hundred percent. It doesn't make sense. So it's costing us eighteen thousand dollars. Yeah. Now, but then we we agreed to it, and then then we had to wait for council to yeah. approve for a building permit, and yeah. then we just got approved maybe like a month ago. Yeah. So that process in itself took about four months. Jeez, I think old buddy was just like upset that that his massage parlor is in there. Yeah, yeah. Like, hey, he must have been okay. a regular there or something. Yeah. My God, I was like, oh fuck, I can't see anything. I just built a wall now. Yeah. yeah. So, yeah, you did message me about possibly, I guess, moving to Vietnam and doing something. Yeah. Also, like, shock was like, what? But then I was, and I thought, man, I think tea would be really good here. Like, so much at your disposal of what you're doing with, I guess, anchovy at the time. But I was actually a little bit worried that, I was actually scared that Vietnam wouldn't get it. 
Because yeah. right now Vietnam is just all into like Jap, French, anything that is not Vietnamese. So I, I didn't want to like, I wanted to encourage you to come here. Yeah. But then I was sort of like scared that, because I, th- I think this, the city can be quite ruthless. It could like just eat you and spit you out. And I didn't want to like, if, but then I was thought, okay, if she's going to finish off the anchovy, then she's going to come over here and do something like is that that's two whammies i don't know but like just hearing you i think you would have actually done it because you're how strong you are would you ever consider coming here and doing something i think so i have considered it um just being here the past week yeah um but i've learned so much about coffee is it coffee money (laughs) 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 that i'm not sure if if i'm allowed to say this i don't know know. um but Maybe, maybe not uh, <laughs> but um, I think it's just being able to use all the produce in abundance. I think it'll be pretty cool. Oh yeah, just yeah. like how much cool stuff you got. I mean, you walk to a market yeah. and how many choices do you have? Yeah, and I, I think I, I don't I don't get that mm. in Melbourne. But then I guess to some degree, that I think that's what kind of sets us apart I- in Melbourne because because there isn't a lot of Asian growers yeah. so a lot of the vegetables are lean on are italian because they've got the same flavor notes you yeah. know bitter spicy um and so i just put our lens over italian vegetables yeah which makes it quite u- unique i guess in a way yeah yeah and then um I gotta, You're on I gotta, fire today, bro. I got a really fun. No, because I want to tell, I want to share T's story, right? Because she's someone I really admire, really ex- like, like there's, you know, we always have like, um, it's, it's more, you know, we as chefs, we always have chefs that we look up to, and it's always like, you know, people always like, what is it, um, Alain Ducasse and stuff like that. It's always these big hitters, mm. but for me, it's just T's approach on everything and like what we've covered today in the podcast. So I have to say, I'm really nervous today <laughs> because also I've been able to spend the week with T, like we've been chatting a lot and I've, I've basically got all the answers that I sort of needed selfishly, mm. but also so important that I'm strong to regurgitate it. Out. I mean, y'all are in the food and beverage, y'all make a friendship. How important is friendships in the food and beverage? I think it's very important because it's such a, on my side, like, you, it's nothing more unique and special than having people just supporting you. Right. Because it's, you know, like I said, it's brutal. Yeah. There's so much stress involved. There's so much happening. You can't, it's hard to escape it. And I guess the easiest people to escape it with is fellow chefs who have like, like, are like-minded. So you can sort of like bounce thoughts and then, you know, they can sort of come, you know, it's like, oh, you know, everything's going to be okay if you do this and that maybe you both can talk on this what's it like i mean friending other chefs in the food and beverage i always think of it as a little cutthroat yeah because you're kind of like almost like trying to take a piece of the same pie like yo we need customers we need the support is it hard to like friend people in the food and beverage or i would say yes because you're not going to be friends with everyone right because everyone i would say everyone's going to have their own goal yeah, everyone has different genres some chefs are going to want to win the award so you know they're going to want all the publicity and some chefs are like don't really care much about it they're a bit lower down so there's different it's like at any friendships or any groups there's going to be different dynamics you're gonna this this group of friends these groups of friends like these alumni these illuminati's type of thing so on my side i find it yeah definitely challenging to be yeah. friends with everyone but you, at the end of the day you you got to try your best to support the industry as a whole i think that's why um, I, I like Australian's award system because it is peer based. It is like it's real mm. and it's respectable as well. Nice. I'm going to take a quick break because my camera died. <laughs> All right. And we are oh, sorry. back. Sorry for the malfunction, everybody. So, T, I want to say thank you again so much for coming on, right. putting up with yeah. us. Sorry for being such a bad host today. Uh, yeah. <laughs> Not our best performance. Well, you, you, you had to carry me definitely for the whole duration of the day. Nah, but so I have a question for you guys. Are you sure. excited <laughs> that Michelin is here? Uh, me? 
I couldn't give a rat's ass. That and it. is the industry here excited? Yes, very excited. Yeah, I've heard. I've heard both sides. More on the excited part. Yeah, I think the best reason I've heard is somebody's like, well, I can have the Michelin boost and how much I charge now. So if I get recognized by Michelin, I can charge higher prices. You're right. That's the best reason I've heard for Michelin being here. Yeah. Well, for, I don't know. I just don't want to give this platform, that platform, more airtime. Because even though we're, we're nobodies, but, you know, any policy is good policy. But it's more, my notion is I find it so silly that... You know, there's always this fight for Asian representation. But then you're chasing validation from the Western world. Exactly. So I, I for me I just don't get it. Like to 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 chase validation and say, Oh, you know, now you're worthy. But no, we've always been worthy. We don't need you to say that, you know, you're good enough to be in the guide. But no disre oh, okay. I think the Michelin Guide is great, but I think that's a European thing. It should just stay in Europe. Yeah. And for a guide to be able to be bought, like financially, to come to a country through tourism boards or whatever companies that they bring in, that removes any, like, validity on it. It's like, you know, there's, there's gray, gray areas. Mm. And I just don't get, yeah, I, I don't get the fascination of, aiming for something that I don't know if there's no proof that's legitimate. Mm. What are your thoughts? Probably the same. Yeah. Yeah. Um, but I can see why it can bring in a lot of money and help restaurants and, you mm. know, and young chefs aspiring to, to be the best. So yeah. it has its, but, but, it has its good and bad, yeah. I guess. But yeah. I don't think a restaurant should just be a restaurant to aspire to have a Michelin star yeah. because you start to lose the focus of why a restaurant is a restaurant. Exactly. And it's it's the new adjective. Oh, it's Michelin star this, it's Michelin star this. And it's like, how did that become an adjective to describe a restaurant? It's right. always, that's always the, f the top end to describe a restaurant. You just can't be all, like a great restaurant that you really enjoy, but it has to be to be valid, it has to be a mission style restaurant. Yeah, I think I have more problems with like the, more of the bib gourmet in their new new uh, category they have as well. What do you mean? I just have more problems with that as opposed to the stars. Like when they try to start to do the street food. Right. And then like, it just feels like the research wasn't there. Cause like, right. how do you do street food in Saigon when you have one little space where you have an auntie on a cart that constantly moves mm. that probably deserves it. Cause she's been doing it 50 plus years. Mm. And it's probably the best like bun me you can get. Yeah. yeah. And then how are you supposed to do it when one space is three restaurants yeah. in one day? Yeah. You just you can't. You yeah. Can't like label uh, that. you know, you would want nothing more for these aunties and uncles to get recognition mm -hmm. for all their hard work, all their dedication. It's not saying what they do is not the same as as in Michelin is it's just different. Right, exactly. It's I agree. you know, because again, you compare it both are amazing in their own right. But then you have, like, say, for example, one of my most favorite restaurants in the world, Septine. Mm. That's a one star. And say you give a, I don't know, a whole deal or a fur or a binary place one star. So you're saying that is the same level as Septine? They're, they're worlds apart, but they're both good in their own rights. Mm -hmm. So I just, I just don't, that's what I mean. It just, the mission should just fucking stay in Europe. I'm not trying to be racist or anything, but it, it's a guide that started in Europe to, I guess, to encourage people to travel around Europe, get obviously Michelin tire, right? Mm. Just to S sell things. Yeah. And it just, you know, when you're over in Asia, you know, you, well, I guess you can get on, on a moped and get on a Michelin tire <laughs> moped and travel around to eat. But it, for me, it just doesn't make sense. Right. And, you know, I guess we don't know who the judges are. So if the judges were, I guess, legitimately people from Vietnam, it could, you know, give more merit to it. But we know how, you know, so in, over here works. So. In, in Vietnam, is there a, you know, like in Australia, we don't have Michelin and there is rumours it's coming. Yeah. So, um, but we have Good Food Guy, which yeah. is in Australia and yeah. then they've got their chief reviewers who yeah. you know who they are and they yeah. go around reviewing. Is there yeah. anything or like Gourmet Traveller that's focused on Asia? Um, 
for Vietnam. And for Vietnam. Oh, even just Vietnam, yes. Yeah, there's. I mean, for me, like, I just follow the local food reviewers. They're yeah. really good. Yeah. You know, but who, she's talking who, about like a, a publication, like news outlet. So I'd say the only one that I can really think of over this. Okay, so obviously, there's um, was it Travel Asia Travel Leisure or Tatler is one of them. But I don't think they're in Vietnam yet. I think they're mainly Hong Kong, Singapore. Based. You're talking for more like Western audience in English, right? It could be in Vietnam. In Vietnam, yeah. Too, yeah. Is there like a chief in reviewer? Is, no. In Vietnam, no. Not really. Well, as in Vietnamese, no. But I guess the only publication that's over here right now doing something like that is Vietcetera. cetera. Yeah. They do this thing called uh, the Bun Mi Awards. So they'll rank restaurants to like, was it one Bun Mi, two Bun Mi's or something? Cute. I totally forgot. Um, and then they do like, you know, restaurant of the year, chef of the year. Yeah. By, voted by a panel of judges, voted by the dining public. Mm. So that would probably be the only one, I don't think. But um, yeah, I don't know anyone, anyone else. But I, I wish there was more. I, but I wish there was like more so from a Vietnamese media standpoint. Yeah. Because they should, they would know the, the landscape of Vietnam's dining scene more than anyone. Of course. Yeah. Of course, definitely. But I think there's always this thing about, you know, how, yeah, just transparency, and just being upfront, transparent and legitimate, I think goes a long way, but I just don't know if Vietnam will get to that point, to be honest. No comment. Yeah, I don't want to get sued for defamation. Or <laughs> I don't think, I don't know. That's good. Does bro Broken Rice Media. <laughs> Speaking of Broken Rice, I don't know about y'all, but I'm getting pretty hungry. Yes, let's go grab something to eat. You got anything you want to plug? You good? No, right. I'm good. I'm just, good. Just go eat a bun me. Yeah. But again, thank you so much for taking your time and coming to chat with us and yeah, we really putting up with it. my dribble today. But yeah. My pleasure. Anytime. Yeah. Anytime. It's cool to get to pick pick your brain too. Yes. Yeah, but um you. for everyone out there, please, you know, look up T, support T. I think she's one of the most amazing chefs, restaurateurs, human beings on the planet. So We'll throw in her links yep. um, on our channels. And no pressure, and I'll be like everybody yes. else. Looking forward to anchovy. Yeah. <laughs> See you on the next one. Peace.